Thank you very much. So yes, I'm Magnus Hansson, Chief Medical Officer at Abliva. And at Abliva, our mission is to target the powerhouse of the cells to improve the lives of mitochondrial disease patients. And we do that by doing innovative drug discovery and development to find new innovative treatments for this group of rare diseases. So I believe that we are focused to become a global leader in mitochondrial medicine. And we can do that based on our long expertise in mitochondrial medicine and in drug development, and with a portfolio of innovative compounds. Um, our leading compound is KL-133. This is currently in a phase two study, but it's a phase two study. Like in other rare diseases, you can only perform so few uh, studies, there are not, simply not just enough patients. So this has been designed to be a pivotal study. So it's a potentially registrational study, the last study to take us to marketing approval. And we're a public company listed on NASDAQ with the ticker ABLI. So I wanted to start with some recent highlights. Last month, the global community came together to raise awareness for mitochondrial disease. And we released a number of short uh, videos about our different activities, and they are available on our webpage and on YouTube. We also recently received a fast-track designation by the US FDA, and this is an important recognition that mitochondrial disease is a serious rare disease, and that KL-133, our lead compound, has the ability and potential to address a really high unmet medical need. And maybe the most important news from our side uh, during the last month is that we have completed the first wave of screening activities for our phase two Falcon study. So that means we are on track to complete enrollment for this first part, to enable an interim analysis around mid next year, as we have planned. So backing up a little bit, what are mitochondria? Well, mitochondria are these tiny bits of your cell that enables efficient energy production. So utilizing oxygen and the food stuff we eat uh, to produce ATP molecules. So mitochondrial disease, that's when there is a genetic mutation or alteration that disrupt this efficient energy generation. So here are some examples of some of the interviews that we have taped with patients to teach us about mitochondrial disease, specifically the patient burden brought on by these diseases. So primary mitochondrial disease, it's, it's a group of rare disease that affects about one in 5,000 individuals. So it is rare, but it's not super rare. They are typically devastating, uh, depending on which organs are involved. So in childhood, it's often lethal, uh, with severe uh, brain uh, manifestations. In adults, with the later onsets, typically the muscles are the, uh, the part of the body that is most affected. And that's how we have targeted our K1 triple three compound. So typically, organs requiring a lot of energy are most affected. And importantly, there are no approved therapies for mitochondrial disease. So this is an illustration of our portfolio. KL-133, as I said, is our lead compound in a potentially registrational phase two study called the Falcon study. Our second program, MV354, targets a different part of the disease, severe neurological manifestations. And that uh, program is phase one ready. So mitochondrial disease, we see it as a really attractive market opportunity. Even with quite modest assumptions, we see that we have over one US billion dollar market. And here we have assumed that we are second to market, and we have also assumed there will be upcoming price pressure also for the rare disease market. And of course, with more bullish assumptions, the case looks even stronger. So since this is a an area with no approved treatments. Of course, there are no established clinical development paths. So we have thought long and hard about this, and we thought, well, let's go to the patients first, because what resonates with patients usually then resonates very well with the regulatory authorities 
and with payers. And we have good feedback for that part. So back in 2019, we teamed up with some of the biggest patient advocacy groups to arrange an um, externally-led uh, drug development workshop, leading to a voice of patient report. And one of the questions we asked this group of patients and families was, well, which symptoms or parts of the disease would you like us, as a drug development company, to focus on? And the answer was pretty clear. There were two things that really stood out. Fatigue, so general uh, sensation of really lack of energy, both mental and physical, and then specific muscle issues like muscle weakness. So that's what we decided to focus our development program on. So um, throughout the clinical uh, program, we are focused on these two aspects of disease. And in the ongoing Falcon study, we have two primary endpoints, one focusing on fatigue, and there we have developed and validated a short form, and the patients can answer this every week on their own smartphone or a device that we give them. And when they come into the clinic, we do a specific muscle test, the 30-second sit-to-stand test. And we've had the um, opportunity to actually test this in really small scale. So in our phase one program, we performed a small phase 1B study. This was a placebo-controlled uh, study, but six active and two placebo subjects. But even with a small uh, group of patients, we saw promising signals of treatment effects, both when it comes to reduction of fatigue and when it comes to improvement of muscle function. And the magnitude of these changes, if we compare to other disease areas, would be considered to be clinically meaningful. And also we saw exposure effect relationship. So the ongoing phase two Falcon study, uh, it has been designed to be uh, a pivotal study if successful. So we have a long screening or a run-in period, then almost a year of treatment. And this is of course a placebo controlled study and we focus on um, a group of adult patients with both the most common type of mutation and the most common and, and debilitating disease expressions from the patient perspective, so fatigue and myopathy. And it has a number of adaptive components, including dose and the final uh, sample size of the study. So the interim analysis that is coming up mid and next year We'll do a sample size reassessment, so we will make sure that we have strong power for both our primary endpoints. So the management team of uh, Abliva, so Ellen Donnelly is the CEO. She was previously CEO of Modus Therapeutics and comes from a lot of senior leadership positions in Pfizer before coming to Sweden. Katarina Johansson, CFO, is with me here today. Eskel Elmer, Chief Scientific Officer, is also the founder of the company. And our latest addition to the management team is Dog Nessa, who has worked with his late stake compounds, bringing them to marketing approval. So really valuable expertise for the phase where we are at. So we see that we are geared up to become a global leader in uh, mitochondrial medicine to deliver good health and well-being for our target groups. So I hope you join us and follow us on this path. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus. We have a couple of questions here already, actually, for you. Good. Uh, that we got from the audience. So the first one is, what are you mainly looking at in your interim analysis? So it's two things. It's, it's a futility analysis, and then it's the sample size reassessment. So it will be completely blinded to us, so there's no efficacy test. Um, of course, we'll also look at, at safety, uh, so we will have an independent data monitoring committee to recommend us, but the main recommendations are two, is continue the study or not, and then what is the final uh, study size. So now we have recruited this first part, and we will base that interim analysis on 40 patients with six-month data. Mm -hmm. And the final uh, study size will be anywhere between 120 and 180 patients. But that is to be determined. As to be determined, uh, yeah. And a follow-up question on that, actually, that we may as well take immediately, is how does the fact that you reach that target screening number just the other week, actually, mm -hmm. um, how does that Im impact the timeline for the Falcon study, including the interim analysis? 
Well, it means that we actually will be able to reach the timeline as planned. Um, so what, what we communicated was that we have completed the, the screening activities, but then the screening window is 8 to 12 weeks. So that means we, we count on having um, all those patients that qualify to enter the study uh, dosed by the end of the year, and then the interim analysis will be based on six-month data. I was also wondering, you talk a lot about um, the feedback that you get from patients, but mm -hmm. I was wondering, have you had any feedback from the medical professional? But, yes, I mean, so this is a quite small community. So a lot of the investigators that are part of our trial are also the leading key opinion leaders in the field. And they, of course, have been instrumental in designing uh, the study and also helped us with interactions with, with the regulatory authorities. So you have close connection to the MITRE community, not just the patients, but also the professionals. I exactly. So we have for quite a long, uh, for quite a number of years participated in the main scientific me meetings and coming from the scientific side, they see that we have a good understanding of both basic mitochondrial medicine, but also the patient need. So I believe that makes us quite strong in, in this community. And of course, that's also important for, for the upcoming commercialization that often, uh, for instance, in, in Sweden, uh, in UK, and a lot of other European countries, as well as the US, these patients usually go to see a few centers in, in each state. So in the US, there is a, um, it's called um, NAMDAC, the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium. So we have good contact with all those experts that see a large proportion of the patients. So that will, of course, uh, facilitate the commercialization phase. We've had um, a question about costs, which is what is mm. the cost of the phase two study? Well, since it is a quite big study, it is uh, an expensive study. Uh, but but uh, then it's the size is, is between 120 and 180 patients. So what we did last year uh, was to finance the study up until the interim analysis. And yeah, cause that was going to be my second question, was the overall financial status of Obliva, but then you're financed through to the interim. Exactly. I have another question here about what the primary launch market is if the trials are successful. Are you aiming at the US or Europe or? Well, we have uh, targeted the U.S. Uh, to be primary uh, in our uh, development, but of course we have received feedback from, from both regions, both from the regulatory side and, and the payer side. And as a final question then, could you just give a quick update what's happening in the other projects? I'm thinking mainly of NV354. Well, we have developed that program to be clinic stage uh, ready and have also discussed that with the regulatory authorities. But now our focus is uh, on our main program. So, so that development uh, doesn't have a clear timeline yet. Thank you very much, Magnus. Thank you.